USA. Hi there, come on in. If you're interested in white-tailed deer, you're a white-tailed deer hunter, you're gonna wanna stay tuned for this program. We have a story on white tails in late summer when they still have their velvet. Oh, some big, big bucks. This was taken at a wildlife research station. You're gonna learn a lot about the behavior of these bucks. We have a recipe for Cajun salmon steaks. Oh, it's terrific. And a rundown of our outdoor fair that we hold as a part of our Outdoors Club. Details on all this coming up in just a moment, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for Outdoor Digest. Where do wildlife biologists learn about white-tailed deer? Well, a lot of their studies are done at deer research stations. An impressive sight in September when a five-acre research pen is full of big bucks. Quite a picture, isn't it? White-tailed deer often stand perfectly still in the woods. You almost wouldn't see them if they didn't move their ears to hear from different directions. The occasional flicks of their tails is a signal that they're relatively comfortable but when there's a group of deer, the entire group is influenced by the deer that's the most nervous, the one that's the least comfortable. The other deer assume that the nervous one saw something or heard something or smelled something that they didn't. When one bolts, others often follow. Deer that are spooked like to head for cover. The perfect cover is grass, especially in the fall when the dried grass is brown, a perfect match for their coats. They disappear when they don't move. There, that slight movement and you can see the deer. Hunters, take a lesson. When you sit in a blind, sit still and the deer won't see you, but move. Scratch your ear, turn your head, that's all it takes, and you'll be seen. That's why deer stand still for such long periods of time. They lay down, they watch, they listen. They're most alert when they're still, and they're least alert when they're moving. That's a lesson we can learn. It's an amazing collection of racks, isn't it? You might wonder how so many big buck deer can be so close together and get along so well. What's the time of year? In September, you can see their coats are changing from the reddish thin summer hair to the grayish thicker winter coat of hollow hairs that will give them insulation from the cold. Also in the summer, their antlers are still in the velvet. Those impressive racks are soft and tender. A big change in their antlers though is caused by the production of testosterone the male hormone that begins to course through their veins in the fall. This is what causes their antlers to harden and the velvet to dry. In the velvet, they avoid touching their antlers against any branch, but when that velvet dries, they go out of their way to rub those hardened antlers against every branch they see. As the fall progresses, they don't stop rubbing on trees after the velvet is rubbed off. In fact, the bigger bucks thrash against limbs and tear up the brush. It's that male hormone that changes their appearance and their temperament. There's quite a variety in the size of the antlers and you can't always judge how old a buck is by the size of its rack. Three factors go into the antler size. Genetics has a lot to do with the shape and number of points a buck will have and the basic size. But food is a much bigger factor than many people realize. A good diet for deer in the summer contains 16 to 18 percent protein and if the minerals in the soil give the deer enough calcium and phosphorus, a year and a half old buck will have a large rack. Eight or 10 points isn't uncommon. These deer aren't all old deer, they're just well fed. That's why their racks are so massive. But as they get older, their racks will become larger. But past the age of five or six, antler size starts to decrease again. Deer are very aware of the size of their antlers, and it's usually the buck with the biggest rack that commands the most fear and respect from the others. That's because he's the best fed, in the best condition, and prime breeding age. 
It's his genes that will be passed on to the most does during breeding season. Quite a difference in the size of the deer, the condition of their coats, and the shapes of their racks. In the fall, it's easy to pick out the dominant bucks. In this group, it'll be the deer that nature is preparing for breeding first. We can tell because his testosterone will start to flow sooner. His coat will change earlier. He'll have the velvet off his antlers first, and he'll begin breeding with the does earlier than the rest. In December, he'll also be the buck in the worst physical condition, and he'll shed his antlers earlier. In a hard winter, the bucks that did the most breeding will be the ones who don't see another summer, but many of his offspring will. That's how nature perpetuates the fittest. Where is the dominant buck? Well, he's the one with the independent attitude. Even in a group, he tends to walk alone. He's easy to pick out. That big boy doesn't always move with the group. He walks slower, listens more, watches, moves when he wants to, but prefers to stay alert. He has a big job ahead of him this fall, a lot of does to chase. And these bucks, well, he'd be fighting with them if they got in his way. You'd be amazed at how many deer are in the grassy fields. They bed there, they're hidden, comfortable. There's a buck here with a main beam tine that appears to be bent, bent down. I guess he bumped it in the summer when it was soft. Normally the tines would grow up and be more symmetrical. Every hunter has an individual idea of the best looking rack. What is it for you? The most points, the most symmetrical, the widest? They're all impressive in their own ways, and they're all beautiful. You know, this is an unusual chance to see a big group of big bucks all in the velvet. In October, their velvet will be rubbed off. They won't be as compatible and they'll be separated into other research pens. But I'm glad we got a chance to see these deer. Most of us won't even see one white-tailed buck this size in the woods this fall. But whatever we do see will be fine. To a deer hunter, there's no prettier sight or more majestic sight than a white-tailed deer. To most hunters, it's the number one big game animal in the great outdoors. White-tailed deer and mule deer, in fact all species of, of antlered game, have velvet on their antlers and of course this is what it looks like when it's rubbed off. This is bone, the fastest growing bone in the mammal world. Antlers, they're an amazing subject. We're going to do a lot more on Outdoor Digest about deer antlers in the future. But right now, for our anglers, we're going to take a look at some really big ones in our trophy book. <laughs> Here's 13-year-old Scott Cox with a 43 and a half inch northern pike that's almost as big as he is. And here's a big walleye. Well, two big walleyes. Bill Van Leuven caught them both. The biggest was 10 and a half pounds. Gene Culver caught this monster 13 pound, five ounce bowfin or dogfish on a bass bait. Jack Williams muskie was 47 inches long. It weighed 33 pounds, nine ounces, but its girth was 24 and a half inches. And look at these big bucks. Robert Lusk took this 231 pound nine pointer with a shotgun. One of the tines was almost 14 inches long. Matt Cavanaugh, just 12 years old, is holding his 11 point he tagged during the archery season. And here's another 11 point taken by Ken Kleinert on the opening day of the gun season. One of the toughest ways to take a trophy gobbler is with a bow and arrow, but not for Michael Craig, who took a 20 pounder with a 10 and a half inch beard. I sat there for about two hours waiting for him, and I seen this one come out. He was with a hen. He was about, about 200 yards away from me. I started calling to him. He didn't want anything to do with me. So I just got really crazy with the call and called the hen over, and he just came right along. And right before I shot, my game tracker came out of the bow, and got caught in the grass. So I cut the game tracker off and I shot him anyway. Well, Mike Craig, your quick thinking, that and your skill as a caller and an archer have helped us to bestow on you the honor of being our Outdoor Digest Trophy Turkey Hunter of the Week.
Dale Kelling of Glendale, Arizona, has been inducted into the Handgun Hunters Hall of Fame in a ceremony following the organization's annual dinner. Larry Kelly, founder of the Handgun Hunters Hall of Fame, made the presentation. Kelling took a record book desert bighorn sheep with a Thompson Contender handgun. Iowa is getting into the business of fencing in ducks while actually fencing out predators from waterfowl nesting areas. By putting up electric fences in certain areas, they've been able to raise an average of 12 ducks per acre as opposed to one duck per acre in adjoining marshes. Michigan will hold two elk hunts this year, one in mid-October, the other in early December. Now the goal is to take 190 elk to keep the herd in balance. Michigan has the largest elk herd east of the Rockies. Hunting firearm accidents are down significantly, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Since 1983, accidents have fallen by over 25% based on a per 100,000 licenses sold formula. The National Marine Fisheries Service says there are severe problems with flounder and groundfish stocks in the northeast U.S. Other species like surf clams, sea scallops, and squid seem to be in much better shape. A new organization has been formed to promote the growth and development of sporting clays in the U.S. and Canada. The group is a separate division of the National Skeet Shooting Association, is located in San Antonio, Texas, and is called the National Sporting Clays Association. <music> I spent a day last week with several state legislators researching the walleye fishing in the Ohio waters of Lake Erie. As some of you might call it a junket, but not me. There are so many lessons to be learned and so much information to be gained by taking the politicians fishing. They're the ones who cast the votes in many cases that set size limits and tell you what are legally acceptable fishing techniques. More importantly, they're also the folks who set pollution limits on industry. They decide how clean the water should be. If you don't think that matters much, you probably don't know about Lake Erie. 20 years ago, it was declared dead by most folks, but a combination of anglers and elected officials got Erie cleaned up to the point where it is today, and it's loaded with healthy, good-tasting walleyes. Now, we all know that when we take our kids fishing, we're guaranteeing the future of fishing. But by taking the politicians fishing, well, we might very well be guaranteeing the future of clean water and its best byproduct, an excellent fishery. In Lake Erie, it's a great example. The sun and moon exert a significant gravitational pull on the waters of the oceans. Do these tides occur on inland lakes, such as Lake Superior? Yes but the tidal changes only average about two inches on the Great Lakes, an effect that is completely masked by the daily changes in water levels due to winds and weather. Our feature event for this week took place a week ago. At first glance, you might think you've come upon a Hollywood set of the Old West, but this pioneer family is not a group of actors. Actually, this frontier camp is authentic Americana and a colorful part of one of America's most popular shooting tournaments. The National Muzzleloading Championships held each year in Friendship, Indiana. In June, several thousand muzzleloading enthusiasts from around the country come here to test their skills with firearms that are essentially the same as those used by colonial Americans. And as some of the veteran shooters can attest, winning here isn't easy. It's very hard competition. This is the best competition in the country. At shorter ranges, flintlock rifles can be just as accurate as their modern counterparts, and some are one-of-a-kind examples of the gun maker's art, authentic in every detail to those made by early American gunsmiths. Who enjoys muzzleloading? Well, just about everyone. We have mountain people down here, we have doctors, we have dentists, we have uh, engineers, we have lawyers, we have school teachers, um, we have home builders, we have them from every walk of life. And nowadays, it's a sport being enjoyed by more and more women. Uh, I enjoy the shooting. Not very good at it, but I do enjoy it. Yes, it's part serious competition, part fun, and part of history. And it's all friendship in this town of the same name in the rolling hills of southern Indiana. Many organizations around the country have some very notable events. We have one of our own here with the Outdoors Club, and it's called the Outdoor Fair. The idea is, is to provide a place in the summer where people can come and meet some of the folks they see on Outdoor Digest throughout the year. Now, this event is coming up this weekend, and here's a preview. 
Every January, the Northern Michigan community of Houghton Lake gets national attention for its annual Tip Up Town USA, the winter carnival that's held on the ice for tens of thousands of ice fishermen and their families. During the past seven years, this same end of the lake has become the home of our summer outdoors club event we call the Outdoor Fair. Once again, we expect to attract some 15,000 people to the high school campus on the south shore of the lake, where they'll find over 100 exhibitors, archery events, a shooting show, sporting dog shows, a muzzleloader's village, hunting and fishing seminars, and lots to see and do for the whole family. Let's take it bit by bit and see what's coming up this year. The shooting show has become a highlight over the years. Crowds would watch Ron LeClaire and Norm Blaker demonstrate the art of longbow and muzzle-loading rifle shooting. Then Harry Reinfelder and Tim Farrigan would put on a pistol, rifle, and shotgun show using modern weapons that dazzled everybody. This year, Watch the traditional shooters battle the modern shooters in a series of trick shooting events. Now I'm putting these hot shots into two teams and they'll compete shot for shot in events that range from tomahawk throwing, longbow shooting and muzzle loading. Norm and Ron have won competitions in all these categories over the years. Then the tricks will move to the modern weapons where Harry and Tim have captured their lifetime trophies. The shooting grudge match. Traditional shooters versus modern shooters at a spectrum of events. We'll hold that at 3 o'clock Friday, 11, 1, and 3 on Saturday, and 11 and 1 on Sunday. The ever-popular Houghton Lake Rendezvous, coordinated by Guy and Evelyn Swan, will be visible by the entrance. A living encampment of families dressed in colorful colonial costumes illustrating the North American fur trade and colonial history. You can talk to them about the periods they represent, and they'll be demonstrating colonial skills such as blacksmithing and open fire cookery. At one o'clock Saturday and Sunday, they'll take over the athletic field for a colonial fashion show, followed by a thrilling reenactment of a French Indian War mock battle. The rest of the time, the athletic field will be the site of Bob Garner's sporting dog show. Look at the rundown of trainers and dogs. Every half hour, the breeds change. 30-year field trial veteran Jerry Dealey works English setters and English pointers in an informative program showing how to train these kinds of bird dogs. Dan McClellan will be there with a pair of excellent Weimar honors. George Perman trains and breeds beagles, and the hound show should be very interesting. Retriever demonstrations will be conducted by Bob Steiner, the Midwest field rep for the Hunting Retriever Club. And a real crowd pleaser are the sled dogs. Marty Williams and members of the Great Lakes Sled Dog Racing Association work their teams around the track. Besides all these dogs and expert dog trainers, Bob Garner says many of them are bringing puppies. Who could resist that row that Bob calls Puppy Alley? Aww. And if you're a bow hunter or archer, bring your bow. That's any bow except a crossbow, any legal hunting bow. The Livingston Archers will be hosting several events, including the traditional silhouette shoot. This year it'll be 2D targets, 14 targets through a wooded course. The prizes, you can compete in several events. The famous Seiko speed round, shoot against a buddy or a slickster you meet at the fair. Winners will put their tickets into a drawing for an American Archery Champion compound bow worth $250. Or a spring weekend at the Lagoon Resort in Houghton Lake. Or three buffets at Coyle's Restaurant. Uh, the long shot, you've seen the Flint Bowman's long bear in years past. The Livingston archers will have a similar long-range target. Those archers who come closest to the mark will win prizes ranging from a bear hunt at Gonzo Bear Camp, another American champion bow, a weekend at the Lakewood Motel at Houghton Lake, plus dinners at Papa Bear's Restaurant in Luzerne and Bear's Country Inn in Grayling. Thirteen archers will win prizes. And for shooters who want a closer target, we present the Bionic Buck. Shoot through the hole and your ticket will go into the drawing for a turkey hunt at Renegade Ranch in Sheboygan, another American archery champion bow, or a weekend at Poplar's Resort at Houghton Lake. Should you miss the hole and hit the buck, 15 consolation prizes will be given, five beef and shrimp buffet dinners at Coils, and 10 dozen arrows from Easton Aluminum. So 15 arrow smashing archers 
could become winners for sacrificing their arrows. Oh, boy. Other events at the fair include a speed casting pond by Outdoors Forever. Prizes include Berkeley Trilene Lion and Fishing Tackle. Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m., it's the Stroh's Duck Calling Contest. Competitors come from all over the Midwest to participate because the winner will qualify to compete in the World Championships at Stuttgart, Arkansas later this year. If you want to learn about the outdoors from experienced instructors, check out our seminar schedule. Many of the seminar subjects will be repeated on Friday and Sunday. That's when I'll give presentations on caribou hunting, my experiences in Quebec. And in the exhibit area, there will be wildlife artists along with a special display of award-winning taxidermy presented by the Michigan Taxidermist Association. A number of the top ribbon winners from the recent competition will be there. You'll see taxidermy as a true wildlife art form. Oh, yes, there will be a couple of antique wooden boats at the Limberlost dock across from the high school. The Coast Guard Auxiliary will give free courtesy inspections for your boat, plus a lot more to see and do. That's Houghton Lake this weekend, the 7th Annual Outdoor Fair. Don't worry about the weather. It's always nice in northern Michigan. Hope to see you there. <music> We received a recipe from Susan Markowitz on Cajun salmon steaks, and mm. it is perfect. Yeah, but it didn't look like there were very many ingredients. Oh, there oh, isn't. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at that <laughs> salmon. That looks like king salmon or coho salmon from the Great Lakes. And wow. we got the steaks rather than the fillets we used. And you're going to rub those with lemon. And just like any Cajun recipe, it's just a bit spicy. And garlic mm. powder. Ooh. And, and I could use salt there if you're salt free. Hold it, hold it. And a little bit of salt and pepper. And there, now this is really handy. This is a Cajun seasoning all in one. It's, you know, most all your seasonings right mixed into one mm. little jar. Well, that makes it easy. And just dip those in there, and you want to make sure they're good and coated. And the secret to Cajun frying is make sure the pan is extremely hot. <laughs> I guess. And you, it looks like it's burning. In fact, Cajun looks like it's burnt. I'll be darned. Well, I, I can't imagine how Garner is going to describe this one. The only thing you're going to equate this to is the finest. <laughs> the finest of prime rib. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's nice and pink and moist on the inside. And don't don't let that burn what looks like burn stuff mm -hmm. throw you. Because this is just done to perfection. The well, butter is so hot that it cooks so quickly on the outside, but it stays moist on the inside. And many Cajun dishes have, I think, too much salty, peppery mm -hmm. stuff on the outside that mm -hmm. I just In fact in this fact doesn't. it was one of those things where I'm the first taste I'm going <laughs> I hope it's not like that, but this this is this mm -hmm. is not and it's not real salty or anything else. It's just so, done to absolute so perfection. For people who don't care for Cajun because it's too spicy and too salty, this is a Cajun That's recipe right. for and you. And it's also a recipe that'll make the price of salmon in the store go sky high, <laughs> yes. too. Yeah. If that recipe looked good to you, but you didn't catch all the ingredients, no problem. It's in the new, improved May-June issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. In fact, all the May-June recipes are there, printed in a handy clip-out format. And you can clip out the free entry form for a Stroh's Fishing Award if you catch a big one. Or you can clip out our sportsman's survey to tell us what you think about current outdoor issues. Or you can clip out the SOS complaint form if you've had a bad outdoor experience that a business hasn't corrected. Lots to read about in the outdoors, with articles taken right from our TV show features. Well, that wraps up one more edition of Outdoor Digest. I hope you've enjoyed the program, and I hope you continue to watch. We're going to be here producing new shows every week on public television, 52 weeks a year. We'll be doing a lot of fishing throughout the summer. But if you don't learn anything else, I hope you're motivated to do one thing. Get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week, right here on Outdoor Digest, we're going to give you a rundown on the outdoor fair, blow by blow, especially, oh, that puppy show. That's going to be great. We're going to also take you lake trout fishing and catch some scrumptious fish, and we have a recipe that is 
Well, on a sandwich, you just haven't had anything better. It's called North Country Spread. Great venison recipe. All this and a lot more. So join me next week right here for Outdoor Digest on public television.